back to our text in Ephesians chapter 5. See that you walk carefully. That's what circumspectly means. See that you walk with great care, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Now, when I'm preaching through a passage of Scripture, I always look to see if I can find sermons, and usually I don't get past the titles, but looking through this fifth chapter of Ephesians, for instance, verse 11, where he says, I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And I remember looking at one message entitled, Eight Reasons Christians Should Not Watch TV. <laughs> and you know what that does to me? Makes me want to watch TV. <laughs> that's the first thing that happens. You tell me Christians should not watch TV. That's, um... And I can see people using this verse like that, redeeming the time because the days were evil. And I've entitled this message, Redeeming the Time. Uh, instead of watching TV, you should be using that time for prayer and Bible study. Who deny that? It'd be a better use of your time, wouldn't it? Instead of watching sports, <laughs> you should be visiting people in the hospital and going to nursing homes and trying to do useful things. That would be time better spent, no doubt. But if that's what I get out of this, I've missed it. I've missed it. I do not have a clue. Now, Paul says in verse 15, see that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Now, you'd find it an interesting study to look up the word foolish in the book of Proverbs. It's found 49 times, and there's many things we can learn from that. But what I think of when I think of walking not as foolish as wise, I think about the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Now there is true wisdom, there's true foolishness. The one built his house on the sand and when the rains came and the floods descended and the winds blew, it crashed because it was not built upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Anything you have, anything I have that's not built on the rock, Christ Jesus, my only foundation, my only ground of acceptance before God is going to be washed away. It's not even real. But the wise man built his house upon the immovable rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my standing before God. He is my foundation. Turn with me for a moment to Hebrews chapter 12. This was uh, such a blessing to me. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken or may be shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now, anything created, if your hope is in anything created, that means in anything you do, it can be shaken, it can be exposed, kind of like you take a rotten stick and shake it, it's going to fall apart, isn't it? It's not going to abide the test. Anything that's made can be shaken. It's only those things which are not made, that are eternal, that cannot be shaken. I love in the book of Hebrews, we read of eternal salvation. It didn't have a beginning in time. 
It can't be shaken. We read of eternal redemption. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We read of eternal judgment. A judgment that's always been in Christ. We read of an eternal inheritance. Now, this is the wise man's foundation. That which he has no hand in. That which is eternal. That which God has done. And there's a very famous line. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. See any problems with that? I would change it to this. Only one life will soon be passed, and it will. Only what is done by Christ shall last. The wise man looks to Christ only, always. The foolish man builds his house upon the sand of human works. You can remember the wise and foolish virgins. There's another contrast the Lord gives us when he talks about walking in wisdom and walking in foolishness. Now, a foolish preacher will have it, well, here's the way you need to have your time. You need to get up so early. You need to spend so much time in prayer and Bible study and, and all Listen, I'm not saying anything against prayer and Bible study. You know that. But as soon as you start making some kind of work out of it like this, it's, it's just not good. I want everybody here to read the Bible. I want everybody here to pray. If you're a believer, you will do those things. But to make some kind of work out of it, here's, the what, here's what you need to do to make things better. No. No, we look to what Christ has done, not what we do. The foolish and wise virgins. What was the difference? They both slumbered and slept. As far as the outward difference, you couldn't see any difference between them. They were both asleep. And both shouldn't have been asleep. But what was the difference? The difference was in something you couldn't see. The oil inside the lamp. The grace of God. Grace in the heart. I think of what Paul said to the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. Here's foolishness. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? You're looking somewhere other than Christ crucified. How foolish. He said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, to the same people, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? God birthed you. You've begun in the spirit through the work of God in you. He did it all. Are you now made perfect and complete by the things that you do in the flesh? I think of what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. They that will be rich. Listen to this. They that will be rich. That's their desire. That's their purpose. That's their agenda. That's what they want. Fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish, hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The wise walk is the walk of faith. <clears throat> Amen? We walk by faith. And not by sight. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus. Now that is wisdom. Look to Christ. Rest in Him. Trust Him. Paul said, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Him? Now I know something about how I received Him. When I received the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can't tell you what the time was. I don't have a date. But I know this. I didn't have anything to trust but him. I didn't have any experience. I didn't have any works. I, I had nothing. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That is wisdom. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness. All lowliness. Humility and meekness. 
forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now that doesn't mean that sometimes you're on this plane of spiritual walking and sometimes you're just walking in a fleshly way. Walking in the Spirit is looking to Christ. Walking in the flesh is looking to your flesh, looking to your works in some way. Walk as children of light. I love the passage of Scripture. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, the darkness of salvation by works. That's what that's a reference to. We lie and do not the truth. We're not being upright. But if we walk in the light, the light of how God saves sinners by Christ, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Walk carefully. You have reason to walk carefully, don't you? How tempted are you to look somewhere other than Christ? Walk carefully. Not as fools, but as wise redeeming, making the most, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Now, question. Is there anybody in this room that doesn't feel like quite often you make a foolish use of time? I do every, every day. Every ball game I watch. <laughs> you know, I could be using this time more profitably. And all of us waste time, but that's really not the point of this passage of scripture. What I would, I'd like to use my time more profitably, but if that's all we're talking about is how you use your time, you've missed it altogether. Now, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Here's this great chapter on time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 1, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Now here, the inspired writer talks about time. Now I think it's interesting, this particular passage of scripture, Pete Seeger uh, wrote music to it, a group called The Birds in 1965 sang this song, and it became very popular. I'm sure you all have heard of it. You know, to everything, there's a season, turn, turn. I, I can't remember how long it goes, but a time to live, a time to die, all those things. Um, but they looked at it, you know, as a philosophy of life. And uh, this is not to be looked upon simply as a philosophy of life. Let's look at it together. To everything, there is a season, there's a purpose, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything, there's a season. He is in control of everything. I love thinking about that. He is in control of everything. To everything, there's his season, there's his purpose, there's his will being done. Now this is something that I uh, try to think about, but God controls everything and everybody all the time. You believe that? God controls the thoughts going through your mind right now. Now you do what you want to do. You can't blame God for your sin. You can't say, well, if I sinned, it was God's purpose. It was His will. He allowed it to happen. He purposed it to happen, and that's why it happened. You can't do that. You can't do that. If you do, it's evil. That being said, God is in control of everything you and I do. And here's the thing about the Lord. He brings good out of evil. Everything we do, we might have meant it for evil, just like Joseph's brethren. But what did Joseph say? But God meant it 
for good. And the greatest example of that is the cross. And we can take everything from that. Um, what's the most evil event to ever take place? The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the most glorious thing to ever take place? The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good the Lord brought out of that. He controls everything. I think of the Lord saying concerning his father, not a sparrow falls to the ground. Heavenly Father. He didn't say without your heavenly father knowing it. He said without your heavenly father. Something as insignificant as a sparrow on the other side of the world falling to the ground in death is all a part of God's eternal purpose. Everything is. Whatever's happened to you, it's God's will for you. Let me repeat that. Whatever has happened to you, it's God's will for you, it's for your good and His glory. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Let me uh, show you a passage of Scripture in Isaiah 46. Isaiah chapter 46. You see, God is God. Anything less than this is not God. This is who God is. He controls everything because He's God. It's not hard for Him to do it. He's God. He doesn't have limitations like you and I do. He's not bound by space and time the way we are. He's God. Look at Isaiah chapter 46, beginning in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. You know, anything you try to compare God to is just bringing him down. That's it. There's no one or nothing to compare him to. He, there's none like him. And what's he do? He says he declares the end. What's going to take place? He declares the end from the beginning. Everything that's happened, he has already determined will take place. You know, when you get up, and probably not many of you have newspapers anymore, I guess. I got one. But uh, when you get up and read the newspapers, remember, well, this is what God has done. This is what God has done. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country, yea, I've spoken it, I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. And that's true concerning everything. He purposes it. He, you know, if you're sick, I hope the Lord heals you. I hope you don't stay sick. But there's one reason you're sick. The Lord purposed it, whatever it is. Whatever affliction you have, whatever good thing's happening to you, it doesn't matter what it is, he is in control of it. I sure am thankful. Verse 2. There's a time to be born. And there's a time to die. There are no untimely deaths. Somebody says it's such a shame. He died so young. Well, he died exactly when the Lord determined for him to die. There's a time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. There's a time to kill. When it's the appropriate thing to do. And there's a time to heal. There's a time to break down. Break down walls. Break down defenses. There's a time to build up. There's a time to weep. What's the shortest verse in Scripture? Jesus wept. There's a time to weep. And it's the appropriate thing to do. And there's a time to laugh. Laughter is the gift of God. There's a time to mourn. <laughs> and there's a time to dance in joy. There's a time to cast away stones, to remove impediments. And there's a time to gather stones, build something. 
There's a time to embrace. And there's a time to refrain from embracing when it would not be appropriate. There's a time to get or to seek. And there's a time to lose, to forget. Treat it as if it never took place. A time to keep and cherish and a time to cast away. A time to rend, tear, and a time to sow. There's a time to keep silence, a time when it's just not appropriate to say anything. There's also a time to speak. There's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time of war and there's a time of peace. He's talking about the great circle of life. What profit hath he that worketh and not wherein he labors? I've seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Everything. Everything. He brings good out of evil. He's made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world, and that word can also be translated eternity, in their heart, so that no man can find out the work which God maketh from the beginning to the end. You know, he set eternity in our heart, so we don't get it. You get it? I don't. I don't know what the Lord's doing, but he does. And that's where we find confidence. He does. I know that there's no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his own labor. It's the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. It's eternal. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which hath been already been, and God requireth that which is past. Now, that is looked upon as a philosophy of life by many people. As a matter of fact, the book of Ecclesiastes is looked upon as a pessimistic philosophy. Everything's vanity. Everything's vanity. Whatever you're doing, it's vanity. And it's a very interesting book. But let's look at this passage of Scripture in light of the gospel. That's how it ought to be looked at. Not just as a philosophy of life, the good side and the bad side, and you've got to bear with both of them. I mean, you can look at it that way, but if that's all you see, you've not seen the gospel. Now, verse 1. To everything, there is a season. God's season. A time to every purpose under the heaven. God has purposed it, and it's going to come to pass at His timing. We're living in God's world. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought. We're living in God's world, and everything he does is perfect. I might not see it, but he does. And I'm so fine with that. There's a time to be born when he gives you life. It's not just talking about the physical birth, but being born from above. Being born of the Spirit. There's a time to be born when he wills it, when he says live, you know when someone's born again? When he gives them birth. When he births them into the kingdom of heaven. When he says live, and they live. And there is a time to die. When the commandment came, sin revived. When I was made to see what the commandment has to say regarding me, sin revived, and I died. Died to all hopes of self-salvation. Have you ever died? And see, there's no way you can do anything to save yourself and you're just as dependent as a dead man is because that's what you are by nature. There is a time to die. And what a blessed time that is. There is a time to plant. <laughs> the tree planted by the rivers of the living water, the blessed man in Psalm 1, planted by God, planted by His grace. 
And there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. Remember when the Lord said every plant, the, the disciples came up to the Lord and they said, Lord, don't you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you said? He said, let them alone. They'd be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Every plant that my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up, plucked up. Verse 3, there is a time to kill. There was a time for Christ to be killed as the sinner substitute. He came in the fullness of time and he was put to death as the sinner's substitute. My sin became his sin and it was time for him to die. The justice of God demanded it. But there's a time to heal. What healing there is in his death by his stripes. Now think about this. What, what is it that heals me? The only thing that heals me is his stripes. That's what makes me clean before God. That's what makes me acceptable before God. By what he accomplished on Calvary's tree. Yes, there's a time to kill, but there's a time to heal. <clears throat> Verse 3, the latter part. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to break down walls which we have built that are contrary to the gospel. And build up walls against salvation by works. And there is a time to break down walls, build people up. Verse 4, there's a time to weep. There's a time that's going to bring on weeping. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. But there's a time to weep. There's so many times to weep. And you wouldn't be human if that were not the case. There's a time to weep, and there's a time to laugh. Laughing in joy over the gospel. Have you ever just thought about the Lord's mercy toward you and his grace toward you, and it makes you chuckle? Hey, it seems too good to be true. There's a time to laugh. Laughing is the gift of God. There's a time to mourn. And when do you mourn? When do you mourn? You mourn when somebody's dead. And there is no hope of them returning. You mourn over sin when you see there's nothing you can do about your sin. Like there's nothing you can do about somebody that dies, there's nothing you can do about your sin. You can't make it better. There's a time to mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. And there's a time to dance in joy with the gospel. There's a time, verse 5, to cast away stones, to remove all the impediments that Keep men from hearing the gospel. You've got to be preachers or religion. If well, you need this work and this work and this work, cast all that away. Get it out of the road. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's it. What must we do that we might work the works of God? This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He has sent. Get rid of all the stuff that hinder people. You know, preachers love to say this. Uh, I heard a preacher say this the other day, and it just, it, it just went, went through me. He said, turn from your sins and trust the Savior. Now, all that's doing is putting an impediment in the way of trusting the Savior. You need to turn from your sins first, then you can trust the Savior. Remove that. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now, and thou shalt be saved. There's a time to cast away stones and there's a time to gather stones together. A time to gather stones up, bring people together, promote the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's a time to embrace, verse 5, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to embrace and fellowship and a time to refrain from embracing when we're not agreed in the gospel. I think of where Amos said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? They can't. They can't. I'm not going to embrace someone in fellowship who's not in agreement with my Lord and how he saves sinners by his grace. There's a time to embrace. 
And there's a time to refrain from embracing. Verse 6. There's a time to get and a time to lose. That word get can mean seek. There's a time to seek. Seek the Lord's presence. Isn't that always, is it, is it always time to seek the Lord? At all times. It's time to seek the Lord, to seek His presence, to seek His blessing. And there is a time to cast away. You know, I want to keep those words our Lord gave us, it is finished, and rest in that. And I want to cast away misunderstandings, offenses, hurt feelings. They're not worth holding on to. Lynn always sings that Disney song to me, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. It's not worth keeping. Verse 7, the time to rend. You know, there was a time when the Lord said it is finished, that veil was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That was time for that to be rent, wasn't it? Now there's perfect access into the Father's presence by what Christ has done. Nothing I need to do, that veil has been rent. There's a time to rend, and there's a time to so, and to mend, mend relationships, mend, or don't let old friendships go sour and nurture new relationships, mend. Verse 7, a time to keep silence when the Lord's speaking. You know, when the Lord's speaking, if you're speaking, you can't hear what he's saying. When he speaks from his word. When he speaks of the preaching of the gospel. Let every man be swift to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to pop off in disagreement or anger. There's a time to keep silence. I couldn't help but thinking about uh, Romans 3, 19. We know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith that him who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, put to silence. If you find in your self an objection to God and his way of saving sinners, keep silent. Keep silent. Stand guilty before God. And there's a time to speak when people need to hear the gospel. There's a time to speak. There's a time to love. Love the Lord. Love his people. Love your enemies. That's all the time. There's a time to love and there's a time to hate. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. I like what Job said, wherefore I hate myself. You see the Lord, you will. I hate myself and I repent in dust and ashes. And a time of peace, the joy and peace of believing. Now we see how time is to be used in light of the gospel. Verse 9, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I've seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. And boy, this life is a travail, isn't it? I mean, one problem comes and as soon as it leaves, another comes. And it's travail. Uh, God said it would be. It's not going to be anything but that. Man that's born of woman, his days are full of trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's the way it is. If you're not sick now, you're going to get sick. If you're not burning hurt now, you're going to be hurt. I mean, that's life, and we don't get it. But the Lord does. Verse 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, in other words, we're just going to have to walk by faith because we don't always do it. But he does. And we don't get it, but we know he does. And we rest in that. I, I'm so happy to be able to do that. I wish I could uh, uh, bottle this up and just realize everything's of the Lord. I don't. Anytime I worry, I obviously I, uh, I'm not believing it at that time. I say I do, but I'm not. 
but we're not going to get it. We're to trust him. I know that there's no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It's the gift of God. And this, one, this is a great verse of Scripture. Verse 14, I know. I know. That whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Now this is who and what I'm relying on, what God doeth. You know, it was God who elected the people before time began. That was totally his work. It was God who redeemed them. It was Christ who redeemed them and accomplished their salvation. It was God who justified them. Every believer stands justified before God. You see, we're trusting what God does, and it's forever. It was God who gave me life. I didn't give myself life. I didn't ask him for life. He birthed me into the kingdom. It's the Lord God, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who preserves me. I don't preserve myself. The only reason I persevere in the faith is because he causes me to. And I'll tell you what, when we stand in glory, we're going to know it's all what he did. Uh, when I stand before thy throne dressed in beauty, not my own. When I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be added to it. Would you want to add your work to his work? Why, that would defile it. I, it kills me when people start talking about rewards in heaven, like believers are going to earn higher rewards in heaven. So, something you've done here on earth, is it going to make it better for you in heaven? You're deceived if you believe something like that. That's like taking something vile and filthy and making, you say, I'm going to put something vile and filthy and make it better. No, no, not at all. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. It can't be taken from, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Now, you know what the fear of God is? It's to look to what he has done only. And if you look anywhere else, it's because you don't really fear him. You don't really know who he is. Those who know him will look only to what he has done as everything in their salvation. That which hath been, verse 15, that which hath been, whatever happened in the past, it's now. There's nothing new under the sun, the wise man said. There's nothing new. And that which is to be, hath already been. <laughs> and God requireth <coughs> that which is past. Does that <coughs> mean <coughs> that God is going to require me to give an account for the sins that I've committed in the past? Well, if it does, there is no gospel. God has given every believer a new history. A new past. Somebody says, history can't be changed. Well, God can change it. He can change it. And he does change it for the believer. And my past is perfect righteousness. And that's what God is going to require. And he's going to require of me. And he's going to reward me for having never sinned and always done that which is pleasing in his sight. And that's true of every believer. It's what the Bible calls justification. One final scripture. Turn to Revelation 22. Now this verse is passing through death and what happens on the other side of death. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. As you die, 
That's how you will spend eternity. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, that's every believer, let him be righteous still. He's righteous eternally. And he that is holy, every believer is holy. They got a holy nature. Christ is their holiness. Let him be holy still. Now let's walk carefully, looking to Christ only, redeeming the time, knowing there's a purpose for everything under heaven, because the days are evil, but think of this, they'll soon be over. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that time is in the palm of your hand. How we thank you that everything is according to your sovereign will. How we thank you that we can rely upon what you have done as everything in our salvation. And we're not to look to anything we have done or intend on doing. But we look to what thy son has done to make us perfect in your sight. How we thank you for the gospel. Our Lord, bless this message for your glory and for our good. As we face this coming week, we ask that you would enable us to walk by faith and not by sight, looking to thy son. Accept our thanksgiving through him. In his name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, come listen.